Hey everybody, it's Dr. Mac here, and I want to do a quick history on the history of reading comprehension research and just reading research in general. See, because until the 1950s, it, reading research really wasn't a thing. A couple people fooled around with it. Um, you gotta remember, psychology wasn't really a thing until the 1800s. Um, the, the measurement tools that we use around psychology, many of them born in um, through the science of trying to explain different, like racist science, um, those methods didn't really start to exist until the mid late 1700s, mid 1800s. So psychology was really born in you know Germany um, in the mid 1800s, and until like 1950, reading research wasn't really a big thing. Um, you know, Huey did a little bit of things in like the early 1900s where he'd stick things in your eyeballs to track like the reading. Guess what? They still do the same thing to track your eyeballs and websites. Um, they just don't put needles in your eyes. Uh, Thorndike did a little bit of work. Um, but it wasn't really until like 1955 and the space race and the whole like, you know, Red Friday of the Soviet Union and a book that got published called Why Johnny Can't Read. Um, and it's very interesting. Our our fear um, and during the Cold War drove a lot of our educational uh, policies from 1955 forward. Um, and why Johnny can't read kind of was like the first one to spark a debate. And a lot of this work was based on uh, behaviorism and, and Skinner and this idea of stimulus and response and trying to break reading down into its parts. Um, and then de and development into stages, like clear cut parts and clear cut stages, really led by the effort of Jean Chaw. Um, and technically she's my, I guess, academic grandmother. Don Liu is my advisor for my PhD and he was, and Jean Chaw was his advisor for his work. Um, but this really gave to the idea that, you know, we have to teach uh, phonics in kind of the systematic ways. Um, and that through stimulus and response is, is how it's done. Now, then comes in um, Noam Chomsky a few years later, um, late 1950s, early 60s, and brings in this whole field of linguistics. And this idea that maybe reading's a natural process. Um, it's not. You have to be taught to learn to read. You will learn language automatically. You do not learn how to read um, uh, automatically. Now, that does not make the meaning making recur during reading as the same as we do with any other encoded text. But the actual skill of decoding the meaning from text, um, that is something that has to be taught. But there was a lot of influences around this idea. And then the Goodmans, um, Ken and Yetta kind of gave birth to this whole language movement. And that continued on up in through the 80s and 90s. Now, if you read the newspaper today, some people even think the fight's still going on. It's not. Um, but, you know, those are the lasting impacts people have. Then comes the personal computer and this birth of this field called cognitive science and information processing theory. And it really was this idea of using the computer as a metaphor um, for learning and that there was this whole idea of prior knowledge. And really, out of all of reading research, if you want to know what's the, you know, the best predictor of how somebody performs in reading comprehension, it is knowing their prior knowledge ahead of time. Um, and this came with this idea of, you know, the brain works like a computer. We have our short-term memory, our RAM, our long-term memory, our hard drives, and you, your input devices, your I.O., uh, input-output devices, and you just move things from short-term memory, repeatedly repeat them, and then they might get into long-term memory. And this came up with this idea of schema theory, and that, you know, we have this file cabinets and these taxonomies, ideas, and they're all connected through our schemas. Um, and while that was going on, how that got played out in the uh, late 70s, early, I mean, 80s, is we also had Vygotsky get translated into English for the first time in 1978. At the same time, people were doing work around metacognition from 78 to 81 for the first time. This idea of metacognition, of thinking about what you think. And then in 1984, um, Poundscar and Brown published a study called Reciprocal Teaching. And that really brought all of this to the forefront. And under their idea of reciprocal teaching, they said, hmm, what are the general thinking skills involved in reading? And they wrote down all of the stuff in reading, and then they grouped them into four categories if they were thought they thought were like four general just good thinking life skills, uh, questioning, summarizing, clarifying, visualizing. And they came up with a way where, you know, the teacher worked with the students in a reciprocal way where the, the student would take on those roles and practice those strategies. 
If you've ever, if you grew up doing book clubs, literature circles, even reciprocal teaching, still called reciprocal teaching, that all traces back to that initial study. And reading researchers really played with this and took this idea of that reading broke down instead of just those skills, those discrete skills. Now we talked about it being, you know, skills, strategies, and dispositions. And what's the difference between a skill and a strategy? Well, a skill, you know, that's like some of the, you know, going back to the behaviorism in, in uh, stimulus and response, that's something that could just happen automatically. If I see the word cat, I don't decode it. I just know it's cat. So you can learn some skills to automaticity. Skills get learned to automaticity. Strategies, on the other hand, they take planning and they take, um, you know, wonder and thinking about if they were successful or not. So um, Paris, Wasik, and Turner really break strategic thinking down into three types. It could be declarative, procedural, and conditional. Declarative, knowing like actually the what of, of, of the strategic thinking. Procedural, knowing how to do it. And conditional, knowing when to do it. And so we started teaching a lot of strategy instruction for, for a few decades, and we still do. There are things called the big eight comprehension strategies. And here's the thing with research. It does show reciprocal teaching, um, if you look at the meta-analysis studies that compare effect sizes in the research, it does show it to have a moderate to strong effect. However, there are some caveats. The strongest effects are with students who might have language goals in their IEPs or um, individual education plans, or even if they're four, 504s, if they have some... Um, you know, some kind of um, health issues that might be causing the language difficulty that might belong in 504, not an IEP. But either way, we know that these kinds of tools do help those students and they do usually have the highest performance ratings, um, which lead to the bigger effects, or the, sorry, the difference in learning gains. They have the highest difference in learning gains, which leads to the, the biggest effect sizes. However, students who are good or strong readers do not benefit that much from strategic strategy instruction. It's already stuff that they've internalized. They're already doing these skills, um, these strategies, and applying the, the, the who, what, when, where, why, when, like knowing when they don't know, that part is happening automatically. And so then they go into that strategic mode. So those students, they have a low ceiling. You know, it does, the effect of strategy instruction hits a ceiling. At the same time, all of the studies we're really subject to problems with instrumentation. You know, if you're giving a test on Summerat, you give them, you know, talking about uh, a lesson on volcanoes, and then you gave them a test on volcanoes, the instructor usually made the test. And so there, there could be bias in there um, as well. And then finally, they don't transfer well. You know, learning about volcanoes and then transferring that knowledge to baseball doesn't seem to work as well. So some people keep going back to prior knowledge and saying, hey, instead of it giving us more reading time, why don't we just have let's just put social studies and science back in because we have to bring in more of the prior knowledge because we know that's the best predictor. Then, you know, now we're getting into the mid 80s and um, now you start to get the sociocultural theories of learning to start to emerge. Um, and this is this involved a lot of bringing in uh, ideas from semiotics and anthropology. Um, and really a lot of qualitative methodologies, especially from Lav and Wagner in their work around uh, communities of inquiry. And, what we're starting to see is the individual not really to be the um, variable of interest in like thinking about the one person and the skills that that reader has, but thinking more about like, what's the classroom look like? What's the society look like? How does that impact things? And now I'd say we're in the era of like what is called network learning. And this is the concept that, you know, well, learning hasn't changed that much per se, except the speed and scope of what information spreads because of the internet, we have to account for the network as both a teacher and a student and part of the learning environments as we think about our reading instruction. And, and so this means that meaning making is both a little bit performative and also part of a collective. You know, my I project an identity on the world, but the world projects identities back at me and somewhere in that gray is the meaning of me that sort of exists. And so we have to think about how do we take, how do we think about this network learning? And you're seeing things around like disciplinary literacies. And then it's not just about knowing what a scientist knows, but how do they talk? How do they hang out? You know, what's it mean to be, it, to, to, to do math like a mathematician? What's it, you know, getting at that being, those dispositions more than just like a set of repeated behaviors over time, but having a sense of belonging into a discourse group. These are now network possibilities. So I wonder in the future, 
Like, will written expression dominate literacy? When you think about it, the written word has had a solid 800 year run. In the span of all of human history, that's not that much. So will written word be the most dominant mode for transferring and making meaning? Um, I don't know that in the future. I watch my own children and they always have um, captions on the TV. Um, well, those are written words, but they also have the auditory words. So maybe it's a multimodal future that we're really facing. Um, they use um, voice to type. They use voice searching. They put on uh, screen readers when they're doing internet searches to have things read to them so they can take notes while they're being read to. So a lot of the accessibility tools that are being built into the web, my student, my children and students that I teach are starting to just use those as tools of literacy. So I wonder if the written word will have a long future. Um, and then I wonder, you know, is the network both the teacher and the student? I get, you know, I join different places to learn new things. I contribute to that network. But at the same time, I'm also searching that network to learn things. So what does it mean when the network is both the teacher and the talk? And then finally, I really think that you need to own your story, but align with others engaged in collective action to the good. Because if you don't own your story in a network society and you're willing to hand it over to corporations, you know, that will cause issues. You want to own your truth. You can never know how truth is shaped online if you don't shape your own. And then you find powerful networks that are willing to change the world through the power of what we can do with literacy. And they push you forward, and together you guys push the greater good forward. That's it. That's my brief history of literacy.